part three section twenty nine of the main woods by henry david thoreau this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three the allegash and east branch section twenty nine we did not at once fall into our path again but made our way with difficulty along the edge of the river till at length striking inland through the forest we recovered it before going a mile we heard the indian calling to us he had come up through the woods and along the path to find us having reached sufficiently smooth water to warrant his taking us in the shore was about one-fourth of a mile distant through a dense dark forest and as he led us back to it winding rapidly about to the right and left i had the curiosity to look down carefully and found that he was following his steps backward i could only occasionally perceive his trail in the moss and yet he did not appear to look down nor hesitate an instant but led us out exactly to his canoe this surprised me for without a compass or the sight or noise of the river to guide us we could not have kept our course many minutes and could have retraced our steps but a short distance with a great deal of pains and very slowly using a laborious circumspection but it was evident that he could go back through the forest wherever he had been during the day after this rough walking in the dark woods it was an agreeable change to glide down the rapid river in the canoe once more this river which was about the size of our assabet in concord though still very swift was almost perfectly smooth here and showed a very visible declivity a regularly inclined plane for several miles like a mirror set a little aslant on which we coasted down this very obvious regular descent particularly plain when i regarded the water line against the shores made a singular impression on me which the swiftness of our motion probably enhanced so that we seemed to be gliding down a much steeper declivity than we were and that we could not save ourselves from rapids and falls if we should suddenly come to them my companion did not perceive this slope but i have a surveyor's eyes and i satisfied myself that it was no ocular illusion you could tell at a glance on approaching such a river which way the water flowed though you might perceive no motion i observed the angle at which a level line would strike the surface and calculated the amount of fall in a rod which did not need to be remarkably great to produce this effect it was very exhilarating and the perfection of travelling quite unlike floating on our dead conquered river the coasting down this inclined mirror which was now and then gently winding down a mountain indeed between two evergreen forests edged with lofty dead white pines sometimes slanted halfway over the stream and destined soon to bridge it i saw some monsters there nearly destitute of branches and scarcely diminishing in diameter for eighty or ninety feet as we thus swept along our indian repeated in a deliberate and drawling tone the words daniel webster great lawyer apparently reminded of him by the name of the stream and he described his calling on him once in boston at what he supposed was his boarding-house he had no business with him but merely went to pay his respects as we should say in answer to our questions he described his person well enough it was on the day after webster delivered his bunker hill oration which i believe polis heard the first time he called he waited till he was tired without seeing him and then went away the next time he saw him go by the door of the room in which he was waiting several times in his shirt-sleeves without noticing him he thought that if he had come to see indians they would not have treated him so at length after very long delay he came in walked toward him and asked in a loud voice gruffly what do you want and he thinking at first by the motion of his hand that he was going to strike him said to himself you'd better take care if you try that i shall know what to do he did not like him and declared that all he said was not worth talk about a musquash we suggested that probably mr webster was very busy and had a great many visitors just then coming to falls and rapids our easy progress was suddenly terminated the indian went along shore to inspect the water while we climbed over the rocks picking berries the peculiar growth of blueberries on the tops of large rocks here made the impression of high land and indeed this was the height of land stream when the indian came back he remarked 
you got to walk ver strong water so taking out his canoe he launched it again below the falls and was soon out of sight at such times he would step into the canoe take up his paddle and with an air of mystery start off looking far down stream and keeping his own counsel as if absorbing all the intelligence of forest and stream into himself but i sometimes detected a little fun in his face which could yield to my sympathetic smile for he was thoroughly good-humoured we meanwhile scrambled along the shore with our packs without any path this was the last of our boating for the day the prevailing rock here was a kind of slate standing on its edges and my companion who was recently from california thought it exactly like that in which the gold is found and said that if he had had a pan he would have liked to wash a little of the sand here the indian now got along much faster than we and waited for us from time to time i found here the only cool spring that i drank at anywhere on this excursion a little water filling a hollow in the sandy bank it was a quite memorable event and due to the elevation of the country for wherever else we had been the water in the rivers and the streams emptying in was dead and warm compared with that of a mountainous region it was very bad walking along the shore over fallen and drifted trees and bushes and rocks from time to time swinging ourselves round over the water or else taking to a gravel bar or going inland at one place the indian being ahead i was obliged to take off all my clothes in order to ford a small but deep stream emptying in while my companion who was inland found a rude bridge high up in the woods and i saw no more of him for some time i saw there very fresh moose tracks found a new goldenrod to me perhaps solidago thersoidea and i passed one white pine log which had lodged in the forest near the edge of the stream which was quite five feet in diameter at the butt probably its size detained it shortly after this i overtook the indian at the edge of some burnt land which extended three or four miles at least beginning about three miles above second lake which we were expecting to reach that night and which is about ten miles from telos lake this burnt region was still more rocky than before but though comparatively open we could not yet see the lake not having seen my companion for some time i climbed with the indian a singular high rock on the edge of the river forming a narrow ridge only a foot or two wide at top in order to look for him and after calling many times i at length heard him answer from a considerable distance inland he having taken a trail which led off from the river perhaps directly to the lake and was now in search of the river again seeing a much higher rock of the same character about one-third of a mile farther east or downstream i proceeded toward it through the burnt land in order to look for the lake from its summit supposing that the indian would keep down the stream in his canoe and hallooing all the while that my companion might join me on the way before we came together i noticed where a moose which possibly i had scared by my shouting had apparently just run along a large rotten trunk of a pine which made a bridge thirty or forty feet long over a hollow as convenient for him as for me the tracks were as large as those of an ox but an ox could not have crossed there this burnt land was an exceedingly wild and desolate region judging by the weeds and sprouts it appeared to have been burnt about two years before it was covered with charred trunks either prostrate or standing which crocked our clothes and hands and we could not easily have distinguished a bear there by his colour great shells of trees sometimes unburnt without or burnt on one side only but black within stood twenty or forty feet high the fire had run up inside as in a chimney leaving the sapwood sometimes we crossed a rocky ravine fifty feet wide on a fallen trunk and there were great fields of fireweed epilobium angustifolium on all sides the most extensive that i ever saw which presented great masses of pink intermixed with these were blueberry and raspberry bushes having crossed a second rocky ridge like the first when i was beginning to ascend the third the indian whom i had left on the shore some fifty rods behind beckoned to me to come to him but i made sign that i would first ascend the highest rock before me whence i expected to see the lake my companion accompanied me to the top 
this was formed just like the others being struck with the perfect parallelism of these singular rock hills however much one might be in advance of another i took out my compass and found that they lay northwest and southeast the rock being on its edge and sharp edges they were this one to speak from memory was perhaps a third of a mile in length but quite narrow rising gradually from the northwest to the height of about eighty feet but steep on the southeast end the southwest side was as steep as an ordinary roof or as we could safely climb the northeast was an abrupt precipice from which you could jump clean to the bottom near which the river flowed while the level top of the ridge on which you walked along was only from one to three or four feet in width for a rude illustration take the half of a pear cut in two lengthwise lay it on its flat side the stem to the northwest and then halve it vertically in the direction of its length keeping the southwest half such was the general form there was a remarkable series of these great rock waves revealed by the burning breakers as it were no wonder that the river that found its way through them was rapid and obstructed by falls no doubt the absence of soil on these rocks or its dryness where there was any caused this to be a very thorough burning we could see the lake over the woods two or three miles ahead and that the river made an abrupt turn southward around the northwest end of the cliff on which we stood or a little above us so that we had cut off a bend and that there was an important fall in it a short distance below us i could see the canoe a hundred rods behind but now on the opposite shore and supposed that the indian had concluded to take out and carry round some bad rapids on that side and that that might be what he had beckoned to me for but after waiting a while i could still see nothing of him and i observed to my companion that i wondered where he was though i began to suspect that he had gone inland to look for the lake from some hilltop on that side as we had done this proved to be the case for after i had started to return to the canoe i heard a faint halloo and descried him on the top of a distant rocky hill on that side but as after a long time had elapsed i still saw his canoe in the same place and he had not returned to it and appeared in no hurry to do so and moreover as i remembered that he had previously beckoned to me i thought that there might be something more to delay him than i knew and began to return northwest along the ridge toward the angle in the river my companion who had just been separated from us and had even contemplated the necessity of camping alone wishing to husband his steps and yet to keep with us inquired where i was going to which i answered that i was going far enough back to communicate with the indian and that then i thought we had better go along the shore together and keep him in sight when we reached the shore the indian appeared from out the woods on the opposite side but on account of the roar of the water it was difficult to communicate with him he kept along the shore westward to his canoe while we stopped at the angle where the stream turned southward along the precipice i again said to my companion that we would keep along the shore and keep the indian in sight we started to do so being close together the indian behind us having launched his canoe again but just then i saw the latter who had crossed to our side forty or fifty rods behind beckoning to me and i called to my companion who had just disappeared behind large rocks at the point of the precipice three or four rods before me on his way down the stream that i was going to help the indian a moment i did so helped get the canoe over a fall lying with my breast over a rock and holding one end while he received it below and within ten or fifteen minutes at most i was back again at the point where the river turned southward in order to catch up with my companion while polis glided down the river alone parallel with me but to my surprise when i rounded the precipice though the shore was bare of trees without rocks for a quarter of a mile at least my companion was not to be seen it was as if he had sunk into the earth this was the more unaccountable to me because i knew that his feet were since our swamp walk very sore and that he wished to keep with the party and besides this was very bad walking climbing over or about the rocks i hastened along hallooing and searching for him thinking that he might be concealed behind a rock yet doubting if he had not taken the other side of the precipice 
but the indian had got along still faster in his canoe till he was arrested by the falls about a quarter of a mile below he then landed and said that we could go no farther that night the sun was setting and on account of falls and rapids we should be obliged to leave this river and carry a good way into another farther east the first thing then was to find my companion for i was now very much alarmed about him and i sent the indian along the shore down stream which began to be covered with unburnt wood again just below the falls while i searched backward about the precipice which we had passed the indian showed some unwillingness to exert himself complaining that he was very tired in consequence of his day's work that it had strained him very much getting down so many rapids alone but he went off calling somewhat like an owl i remembered that my companion was near-sighted and i feared that he had either fallen from the precipice or fainted and sunk down amid the rocks beneath it i shouted and searched above and below this precipice in the twilight till i could not see expecting nothing less than to find his body beneath it for half an hour i anticipated and believed only the worst i thought what i should do the next day if i did not find him what i could do in such a wilderness and how his relatives would feel if i should return without him i felt that if he were really lost away from the river there it would be a desperate undertaking to find him and where were they who could help you what would it be to raise the country where there were only two or three camps twenty or thirty miles apart and no road and perhaps nobody at home yet we must try the harder the less the prospect of success i rushed down from this precipice to the canoe in order to fire the indian's gun but found that my companion had the caps i was still thinking of getting it off when the indian returned he had not found him but he said that he had seen his tracks once or twice along the shore this encouraged me very much he objected to firing the gun saying that if my companion heard it which was not likely on account of the roar of the stream it would tempt him to come toward us and he might break his neck in the dark for the same reason we refrained from lighting a fire on the highest rock i proposed that we should both keep down the stream to the lake or that i should go at any rate but the indian said no use can't do anything in the dark come morning then we find him no harm he make him camp no bad animals here no grisly bears such as in california where he's been warm night he well off as you and i i considered that if he was well he could do without us he had just lived eight years in california and had plenty of experience with wild beasts and wilder men was peculiarly accustomed to make journeys of great length but if he were sick or dead he was near where we were the darkness in the woods was by this so thick that it alone decided the question we must camp where we were i knew that he had his knapsack with blankets and matches and if well would fare no worse than we except that he would have no support nor society end of part three section twenty nine recording by expatriate in bangor maine